Live from the Commonwealth Club of California, it's the week-to-week political roundtable on Thursday, September 10th. Now, let's face it, it has not been a good week for the president. Bad poll numbers, he's behind in the money game. There were revelations from yet another bombshell book. More Republicans announced support for the Democratic candidate, and I don't even want to make fun of the Trump vote parade that sank. But the Trump campaign tried to get back into the swing of things with a new TV ad touting what it called a great American comeback. We saw images of a warehouse to demonstrate businesses getting stronger, and it showed people expressing alarm at the prospects of a Joe Biden victory. Only one little problem, the warehouse in the ad was actually in Ukraine, and the people looking distraught were models from Europe. So I'm guessing next week won't be much better for the Trump camp. I'm John Zipper, your host for the week-to-week political roundtable. On today's program, we will discuss the president's handling, if that, of the COVID-19 pandemic, the presidential race, violence at protests, police reform, and more. You can submit questions for our panelists tonight. If you're watching us live on our YouTube channel, just use the chat feature on the page to submit your questions. I'll try to work some of them into our conversation here tonight. Now let's meet our panelists for today. Melissa Kane is a journalist and an attorney, and she's a veteran of Week to Week. Good to see you again, Melissa. Thanks so much for having me. Barbara Marshman, I should say they're all veterans of Week to Week. And Barbara Marshman is a former editorial page editor of the San Jose Mercury News. You can follow her on Twitter at Barb Marshman. Good to see you again, Barbara. You are on mute, I believe, Barbara, though. I just said good to see you. Is that better? (laughs) Much better. (laughs) Okay. And last but not least is C.W. Nevius. Chuck Nevius is the columnist for the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. He also produces the C.W. newsletter, which I heartily recommend you track down. And you can probably find out more about it at C.W. Nevius on Twitter. So good to see you again, Chuck. Good to see you. I'd just like to apologize for my hair right now. <laughs> me too. Me, mine has gotten totally on mine as well. Let's, <laughs> let's get right into it. Um, This week, Bob Woodward's new book about the president, called Rage, has grabbed headlines for its inclusion of quotes by Trump in which he admits he downplayed the severity of the COVID-19 pandemic. They were reportedly made in the course of something like 18 conversations that Woodward taped with the president. I'm going to start with you, Barbara. The Trump administration was already the subject of a negative book by Bob Woodward called Fury. Why would he spend hours talking to him in the course of 18 phone calls? I'm supposed to know this? I mean, it, it is the question, isn't it? And yeah. some things like, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised how many people on Twitter and are, are saying, the Trump folks are saying, well, of course he was trying to downplay the, the, the virus. It was, you know, uh, that's what a leader does. You don't try to panic people, not mentioning that he panics us about everything else. I, I have no clue what the man is thinking, but it confirms my... Uh, my own judgment of his judgment. (laughs) Melissa, what do you think when you first heard about these comments? I mean, was anyone really surprised? Did anyone change their mind about him based on this? I, I, I don't think that it was one of these, I mean, I had the same questions you do, which is like, why are you talking to Bob Woodward um, right before the election? But it's one of these, I don't think any of his supporters have, have peeled off. And I don't think anybody who didn't want to vote for him is, is you know, is suddenly, um, you know, has their, had their mind changed. It just reaffirms what they already think. So it's, it's you know, it, it's going to take a lot more than this. <laughs> Having said that, having said that, um, it is true that if you look at the trajectory of the polls, when the, when it was initially just the coronavirus, and there were there was a lot of criticism about the handling of uh, you know of our defenses, and at that moment, um, you did see a, a dip in the polls. He was actually losing some ground. I mean, not it wasn't huge, but you know these things are close, uh, and he was actually losing a bit of ground. And then the um, the George Floyd incident happened, and then we ended up with, you know, we sort of been spiraling in certain places for certain people. And, um, and then his poll numbers sort of went back up. So it seems like when there's the, when the focus is on the COVID-19 treatment or response, it's, um, it's less good for him. And I think he realizes that. And that's why he's sort of you know, deploying a lot of resources to deal with this. Um, but when it's on, you know, civil unrest and these other issues, then he believes, and I, and I think the poll showed that, that that's really good for him. So I think he's going to be looking to, of course, 
flip that back over uh, because it, it, it really does not help. It really hurts his numbers when we when we talk about these things. Yeah, Chuck, it did come right when he was trying to flip the uh, conversation and, and uh, this this took over the news again. Yeah, I think two things. One is it must be maddening to work in the White House and have him consistently hijack the news cycle. And there's a story in The New York Times. I mean, he did it last week, this whole thing about losers and suckers in the in the military. And that was a that was a maelstrom. But then he gave a press conference, which gave the story another two or three days of legs where he denied things and so forth. Did it again today. Calls a press conference about this Woodward thing. Has nothing new to say, but stands in front of the, you know these reporters. He insults the reporters. He goes through all these things. And it must be pull your hair out time in the White House. They've got to think. As several people mentioned, you've only got 50 some days before the election. You're burning up those days. They were trying to say... The jobs report looks encouraging. And by the way, we're withdrawing from Afghanistan. Those were the those are going to be talking points that they felt would would go well. And instead, we're off on this. And second, to Melissa's point, it isn't a surprise. My God, we've got we've had his niece. We've had his sister. We've had his right hand man, Michael Cohen. We've had Woodward. And then he comes back and takes a second bite of the apple. And more than that, we have heard from Trump. And the things that he said, why in the world would you take another shot at John McCain now? There is no political advantage to that. John McCain is deceased. He's a beloved American figure. It was generally seen as a cheap shot to start with, but he cannot let these things go. And it's, it's where character matters, and it's what we're seeing. It's, it's, a, it's a meltdown of his own making. And I want to get more into the whole the military comments and and we we've got like, like a whole lineup of bombshells that we kind of have to get to one at a time. Um, sticking with this bombshell, uh, it, it's kind of related to uh, some news this week that an, uh, an official of the Department of Health and Human Services um, uh, reportedly is trying to dictate what Dr. Anthony Fauci can say to the media. Um, Melissa, the the image that's emerging of the Trump administration is one that is definitely far more worried about its poll numbers than about dealing with a raging pandemic. Um, I guess the innocent question is, can they flip that around? Can they turn it around? Or is, is kind of maybe alluding to what Chuck just said, is this now the ingrained uh, message of them? I mean, they, they had their chance. They're just going to have to live with it for the next 53 days. Well, I, so I read that article. And what was interesting to me about the article is that, that he tried. Right. It, there's no evidence that Dr. Fauci changed his message or didn't go with what he thought was appropriate. So I felt like the headline there was a little inflammatory. And, of course, and look, if the subject matter wasn't so serious, um, it looks like a slimy guy in PR, you know, yelling at you about what you can and can't say. And that kind of thing actually happens in pretty much every administration. <laughs> Uh, and a lot of businesses too, um, but again, the subject matter I think makes it makes it you know a, a slightly different. But but that was the impression that I got was just like this jerk in the PR department, whatever. Um, ignore him, and it seems like they had. <laughs> um, but but you know, it clear it's clear they're trying to um, you know fashion this in a way that's most that's most. Well, it's tough because the president has aligned himself with sort of the don't freak out line, right? The sort of everybody be calm line. And so if, if you're if that's where you're going, then even if you're not a Trump supporter, which, of course, this person probably is, um, you end up towing the president's line, whether or not that's your intention. But he was definitely telling them to sort of downplay transmission from children and, you know, and, and other and other kinds of things and, and certainly blurring the lines. But that's. Um, but that's unfortunately <laughs> not a new phenomenon. Sure. For his part, Dr. Fauci said, no one tells me what I can say and cannot say. I speak on scientific evidence. Um, this kind of comes out at the same time this week, and we saw a vote today uh, in the Senate on a, a doomed attempt by Mitch McConnell to try to ram through a uh, a. a a slimmed down uh, coronavirus economic relief package. Um, the Democrats said it was not enough. Barbara, uh, from what I'm reading, it sounds kind of like the White House is closer to Nancy Pelosi than to Mitch McConnell when it comes to being willing to work on really an expensive relief bill. Um, any thoughts on that? Is it just something to... to I think he really likes your haircut. 
Um, <laughs> I, um, I don't know. I, I guess he wants something done more than McConnell does. Uh, but a sticking point, no matter what, is going to be help for states and local government. And that's just that's just going to be very difficult to get past because since the federal government did not step up in the beginning, so much has been done state and locally. I mean, we're just having terrible budget, facing terrible budget problems here in San Jose because of it, Santa Clara County. Um, so I, yeah, I, I don't see him getting there, but clearly he wants to get there more than Mitch does. Mitch probably has his eye on the Senate more than uh, getting this legislation passed. Chuck, we were talking just before we, we started the program kind of about some changes we're seeing in the real estate market and, and office space and things like that. But, uh, you know, we all know the story about the stores that are closing and the the uh, uh, restaurants that are closing. And they're saying maybe half or more of the restaurants that have closed because of the pandemic might never open, re- yep. open again. Um, we're looking at something that the next president, if, if they found a vaccine that worked and they've got it through stage three trials and they got it released and somehow they produced billions of, of, you know, in other words, if they could whisk away COVID next week, it's still going to be the, you know, the effects of this is still going to be issue number one for whoever is in office in January uh, 21 or whatever it yes. is. Am I right? I think that's true. I, I mean, I think the optimistic view, I'll, I'll try that optimistic view, would be that it's going to be a reset for cities like San Francisco. Uh, people are leaving. There isn't any question about it. I see moving trucks on our street every single day. We live in a building of 100 units. Uh, 11 of them are for sale right now. Uh, and, the, and what you mentioned, which I think is really a big deal, is that the businesses, the most recent information, we were talking about it earlier, Pinterest has decided not to pick up its lease on this brand new building that was going to be built down here in South of Market, where the tennis club is. Over 400,000 square feet of office space that Pinterest was going to lease, and they have now paid, I, I, I said, I think 11 million, you, you think it might be more. They, they paid a lot of money to get out of that lease. And I don't know where that project goes. And I don't know where these other projects go. So the, the optimistic view is rents go down, uh, we reset the city, we come back. I, I saw the other day a, a, a sign that said, fully equipped restaurant ready to lease. So if people come back, if there's money available, these things might be in the pipeline. But if not, and if people have left the city and are not coming back because they can work remotely like this, we're seeing a sea change in what is what is happening in the economy of the United States. And I think we're all kind of hanging on for dear life to see what happens. Yeah. Barbara? I was just it's, it, it's sad for me because it's a time when urban living had become what I thought it should be, a more a more popular thing. The kids wanted to be here, even young families with kids, raising kids in the city. Um, here in San Jose, we're, you know, densifying, building new neighborhoods, and uh, that has its controversies, of course, but, but a lack of people to populate them has not been the problem. Um, so... I think you're you're right, Chuck. I you know, I think it's really sad. It's just that do those people come back? The Chronicle had a story the other day saying a lot of the people who left they felt they had to leave, but do they still want to come back? And you, I don't know if you saw the Jerry Seinfeld thing. He wrote New York is experiencing the same thing. And this, this guy had written a, an op-ed saying, we're moving to Austin, Texas. We can't take the New York anymore. And Seinfeld wrote a very funny and very scathing you know, rebuttal to that. Enjoy Austin. You know, I'm sure that the culture of Austin will be terrific. And he also said, you, do you think Paris is going to go, is going to go down the tubes? Rome, New York, you know, Los Angeles, you really think all these cities are going to disappear. And that is, again, the optimistic view. But right now, I, I think we're, we're definitely wondering where this is headed. And, and I'm not confident at all that the current administration has a good sense of where to direct us. You, you did just have today, what was it, 150 businesses in New York, write a letter to de Blasio telling him it's all falling apart and you have to do something. 
um, and talking about uh, the story, not not the uh, the CEO's letters, talked about how people who stayed in New York are feeling much more positive. But the you know the folks who have left are are not necessarily. It will be interesting to see then. You know, we went through this the big cycle, the kind of a down cycle that big cities went through in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. They kind of started trying to change things. In the 90s, you know, Chicago and New York were roaring again. And, uh, you know, this probably isn't that type of a cyclical thing. Yeah. And there you had cities kind of reinventing themselves and reinventing their downtowns and stuff. But uh, it will definitely be seen, I guess, uh, how how much this how deep this goes and how how long it takes before the cities adapt um i just think economically i'm afraid the the you know so many of those small businesses being wiped out which also means the people who own them who were probably up to their necks in debt you know may never again be able to it's it's going to take a long toll um wow so we need to talk about something happier so um Let's move to another one of these bombshells, also on the political front. President Donald Trump has had a complicated relationship with the U.S. military from the start of his 2016 presidential race, in which, as we noted, he famously insulted war hero Senator John McCain and later attacked the parents of a fallen soldier. Um, but in, in office, his administration gave the Pentagon's budget a huge boost. Now his campaign is dealing with allegations that he had insulted U.S. troops who were killed or injured in the line of duty, reportedly calling them suckers and losers. Chuck, what do you make of this latest controversy? You you kind of started down this road a little bit. Well, I, you know, I don't think, we're, again, we're not really surprised at this. Uh, I think the astonishing thing is not so much the stuff that's reported anonymously, but the stuff that he says out loud. Yeah. And to say that about the generals just recently, again, this is a press conference that really didn't need to be held. And he, he really had nothing to add. He wanted to be in front of the cameras. He's convinced that he can sway people if he gets in front of the cameras. And then he goes off on this tangent about his generals are more concerned about keeping the lobbyists happy by starting wars to keep the lobbyists happy. And I'm, I just, the sound of his staff smacking their foreheads in the background were like, what are you talking? Then they try to walk it back. And um, somebody said, I, I wish I could remember who it was, because I thought, I thought it was a really good point. That Trump is like a day trader. Every single day is a new day. And he can't let any slight go. And yeah. every he reinvents another controversy every single day. And it goes back to something we've said on the show, which is there's nothing easier to maintain than a bad reputation. He's, he's got that knocked, you know. And he has an amazing capacity to to create bitter, lifelong enemies who, you know, like Michael Cohen, who was his right-hand man, who is now writing the books about his generals, who he, who he brought in, who he praised, are now turning on him. And it's always the same reason. It's always Donald Trump and the way he behaves and the idea that people are losers or suckers. And if, if he really said that to John Kelly at the grave of his son, the, the, the level of cruelty is incredible. It's, it's just hard to believe. And yet, from what we've seen, it, it, it fits right into the into the trend. Uh, Barbara, were you about to say something? I was just going to say some of the hardest hitting ads I've seen against Trump are by veterans groups. Now they were they were ready instantly when the the book landed. In fact, people. Uh, um, People accused them of having had advance notice that it was coming and so on. And and I heard one of the one of the women, one of the mothers who quoted and talked about how, no, we were just all organized anyway. And one person called, and, you know, within an hour we had these people together. Um, but I don't know about the rank and file. I don't know of military families generally. They're they're pretty Republican. Yeah, uh, they were important to him. The the veterans and the rank and file were important to him in 2016. Yeah, yeah. So I know he's trying to shore that up. But right? so recently, there's a Military Times did a, a poll recently of rank and file folk, and they found that it's about 50-50. Um, support and don't support, and that's um, and that's a, a sort of a disapproval rating that has gone up initially it was around um 40 percent 
disapproval. Now it's at 50 among mm -hmm. the rank and file. Um, but again, I mean, this is, you know, how many <laughs> we should, who knew back in 2015 that we should have, you know, uh, had a drink every time we had to use the word bombshell. Uh, you know, <laughs> it seems pretty easy for his supporters to say, you cite no sources. Yeah. He's done a lot for the military in terms of funding and X, Y, Z. So, you know what? Don't really care. Uh, yeah. and I, I don't believe it and I don't care. Um, and because he's, you know, what comes out of his mouth and what he's actually doing, you know, there may be some disconnect. So we're like, we're going to go with what he actually does. Uh, so I think it's been a fairly easy, as much as it, um, got uh, certain people really fired up. I think for a lot of his supporters, it's been really easy to roll right past it. And that's what happens when you publish articles with no, <laughs> with no sources on the record. It's really tough to get that kind of thing to stick. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't think really gets mad enough to uh, to go on the record at some point. Yeah, but yeah. it but that has been a, a part of journalism for a long time, yeah. and it it was not. I'm not saying you shouldn't have published it. I'm just yeah. saying that you're not going to change yeah. minds without a legitimate source on the record. Right. Uh, you know, I'm not saying you know, again, it's nothing wrong with putting it out there. You and I know that, but it's yeah. um, it's, um, you know, it's really hard to get people on the record sometimes, as we all know. Sure. Um, but it but it is to say, you know, and then you wonder why the polls don't move because because it doesn't it, it won't stick yeah yeah i just think it has changed because i think if we had a story where a it was from a reputable source which is the atlantic from a reputable editor which is the author and we have it confirmed by many places including fox news i think we take it pretty seriously but in this day and age a you don't want to go on the record because you're gonna get absolutely scalded on twitter and b people are doubting the news and i think the other thing that reminded me when I heard you talking, Melissa, is the 50% thing. His margin is so slender and was so slender in 2016. There was, it, he had, every, everything had to break exactly correctly. And he is really walking a tightrope here, trying to keep those people in line. And, you know, right now the polling says he's not. So, uh, is there an October surprise? Is there something he can he can seize upon? Is the debate a disaster for Biden? Otherwise, it seems like I was wrong in 2016, but I'll say it again. <laughs> it seems <laughs> like he's going to win. I mean, he's going to lose. Biden is going to win. But it's just everyone is so uh, David Pluff, I, I know called the Democrats bedwetters because they were so everybody's so freaked out about maybe something will happen. And I suppose it could, but it just seems unlikely at this point. I don't yeah. think the margins are that are that strong for Biden. I mean I'm astonished that they're not stronger. So I'm you know I thought he'd lose last time, but I'm I'm one of those who are uh, what was it, bedwetting or whatever? I'm, I'm, I worry. I wasn't speaking, I wasn't speaking personally, Barbara. I wasn't. <laughs> But, but I think you're I think it's a great point. I mean, it's not I mean, people get worked up about things that Trump does or is alleged to have done. Um, but remember, it's not Trump or Jesus. Right. It's Trump or Biden. And yeah. it's Trump may still be the, 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 the choice that people make, given the choices. Yeah. Um, and they go, OK, well, I'm not I'm not in love with what he said about the military. I wish he hadn't said that. But fundamentally, um, I think he's more in line. You know, his policies and his actions are more in line with what I like to see in the White House, or I'm scared of what Biden is going to do. Um, so, you know, so I think that's that's the other element as well is these 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 bombshells as they were don't happen in a, you know, in a vacuum. Yeah. Which makes the debates a, a, a cage match, death match. I mean, it's, it's going to be huge. And at this point. Trump has so vilified Biden. If he remains, if Biden remains upright and speaks in complete sentences, I mean, he's so overperforming compared to what he's implies is going to happen. But there's always a chance. There's always a chance for some kind of a miscue, and and that could happen. But I just think the the debates are now front and center. That's going to be that's going to be it. Yeah. Well, a new Reuters poll out today shows that Republicans still hold favorable views of Donald Trump. That's not a surprise. And a majority of Republicans said that the reports of Trump's comments had not influenced their choice for president. Overall, 85% of Republicans said they had a favorable impression of Trump, about the same as last week. Um, in terms of, of uh, specifically in the military, I mean, this is also the year in which we had the whole controversy about uh the reports, the intelligence reports that uh, the Russians were paying the Taliban bounties to uh, kill American troops in Afghanistan. Um, 
you know, it's kind of one thing what he might complain about generals and, and uh, maybe insult people. But I would think if I were, you know, frontline U.S. service member, um, knowing that that didn't exercise our president, I, I, I would, I, I, I'm, I'm shocked that that wouldn't have moved the needle. Um, for well, would it have moved you to Biden? That's right. Right, not Biden, Biden who's be involved son. with Donald Trump, but would you be willing to vote for Biden? That is a farther way to go than uh, hold my nose and do the thing. Right. Yeah, but but again, Biden is not um, he's not Chase Abodine. I mean, he's 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 the father of someone who went to, to uh, was he was his son in Afghanistan? Um, you know, I mean, was Afghanistan? It's a service member family. I mean, it, it, compared to. You know, Donald Trump, who, you know, had bone spurs and that tragically prevented him from being a hero of the war. <laughs> Those can be very painful, John. You have, you have to... <laughs> well, okay. I mean, if you're if you're a service member, though, I mean, you may not, you know, you may be more interested in, in you know, the Pentagon in the budget for the military. Um, mm-hmm. And Joe Biden can have a son that served in the military and then get into office and do things that you disagree with. I mean, like there's, you know, I think that there's a, a complicated web of interests yeah, there. Yeah. Ever since the Access Hollywood tape, I mean, we pretty well discovered, that, you know, that that looked like the end. That had to be the end. You know, what's his name? Rice Priebus. So you, you've got to pull out. You can't, you can't. Yeah. No, no, we'll just, we'll just blast right through this. And he has. So he's infuriating to, to Democrats and to liberals. And I think he's, he's invigorating to some Republicans. But I think the question, it's, there isn't, Melissa said it earlier, and it's true. There isn't any question who he is or what he is. We know. We've seen it reported. We've seen it written about by people who were close to him, and we've seen it with him. We've seen him say it out loud. And the question is, are you willing to put up with this or not? And is it anybody but Trump? Is that enough to, to carry Biden over the line? It might be, but there are a lot of people who are just shrugging it off. Yeah. Well, and as... Uh we've said and as others are saying in fact from our viewers on youtube um it of course matters where those votes are you know mm-hmm. those whatever twenty eight thousand voters in wisconsin wouldn't have mattered if hillary had lost them in california um and to barbara's point i mean you in those states the numbers are pretty close i mean you can look at national polls that show biden up 12 percent or whatever but that's not useful that's just a bunch of people in california mostly you know that's a, um, but if you look in the states where it matters uh you know it's, it's a lot closer and then you look at things that are happening in, in kenosha wisconsin and you know and in minneapolis minnesota those kind of states that can really um have an impact and i think the reaction to those things happening and going back to the, the whole floyd incident uh i think that may have more of an impact on people in general on how you look at this presidency, because there's those of us and I'm one who thinks that the president's militaristic response is responsible for more violence, uh, certainly encouraging the white supremacist uh, gun folks to come out and, you know, and help the police. Um, it horrifies me. It probably galvanizes the base who would never think of being on the other side ever <laughs> protesting anything. I, I grew up, I came of age in the sixties, you know, I, I'm i a protester. Well, well, let's think, talk, go ahead, Chuck. Well, real, real quick, but I was just gonna say, the idea that, that these protests, that suddenly Kenosha, Wisconsin became a hotbed of racial protest, that's not what happened. What happened was there was a very serious incident and it caused people to react to it. And and that the whole idea that what, what Barbara said, I mean, that was terrifying. Our militia with assault weapons who not only came, came out, but shot two people, three people. I mean, that is, I, I don't think I've ever seen in my lifetime you know, you're you're heading toward armed groups in the streets, and that is honestly frightening. Um, and I think we have the sense that uh, the president would would not calm things down, would not care to calm things down. Kellyanne Conway said, "The more violence there is, the better it is for us." I mean, it's that is a that is a scary proposition, and we'll see how it works out. But that's that scares me. 
Well, let's, let's talk about that a bit more because, of course, there was Kenosha where uh, the 17 year old uh, gun aficionado from Illinois came up because he pointed out he, he shot and killed one person in, a, I think, a car park. People were chasing him. He shot and killed, I guess, one of the people who was chasing him, if I'm understanding that correctly. Um, there's that just whole weird thing of, like you said, the militia kind of act, activity moving in. There's also the issue of how the police treated him, how the, you know, uh, the, 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 the deference he was given uh, there and he wasn't stopped by police. He apparently even tried to give up after he had shot and killed the one guy and, and uh, they wouldn't do anything. Um, comp- you know, and then when he was down in, in Illinois, there was, you know, some delays in him returning, uh, you know, it, let's just say that he got different treatment than the guy who was shot in the back seven times because he was walking away from the police officer. Then there's Portland, which is, you know, Donald Trump's idea of the, like the absolute worst result of having communism in our country um, where, and not to make jokes of, I mean, there, there have been violent confrontations there, but of course there was also a death that resulted uh, this time. It was a, the death of uh, a right wing uh, uh, I don't know if he was a militia member or just one of these far right groups that he was a member of. And in his case, the the person who killed him was a left wing activist who later was was uh, killed by police. Um, what I kind of want to ask is: it's interesting that this is happening in Kenosha, it's happening in Portland. We haven't seen that here in the Bay Area. And now, is this just the, kind of the 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 way the dice roll, it, it happens in certain places where something sparks it, or, you know, are political leaders here dealing with it differently? Um, what, what do you think, Barbara? I mean, why haven't we had that kind of violent confrontation here? We haven't had that kind of confrontation. We had a little bit of a, a stir here the few, first few nights in San Jose, and, and the um, uh, very poor, I would say, handling of it by our local police then generated a whole new round of demonstrations. They've been largely peaceful. Um, We did have an incident here uh, last week in which a group of uh, serious defund the police folks um, actually massed on the lawn of Sam Licardo, Sam and Jessica Jessica Licardo, the mayor, and his wife, they weren't home, and um, and graffitied the whole front of the house, including F.U. over the front door, and about 10 feet away from their living room window, which had a Black Lives Matter sign in it. Um, it's... Um, it's a little frightening. I, I'm not afraid. And, you know, in San Jose, there have been there have been a lot of peaceful discussions. But people like, you know, leaders like Licardo, I mean, he is he has tried to be um, he's been very supportive of Black Lives Matter. Folks pr- painted a Black Lives Matter street sign sign in the middle of a street in San Jose. And a lot of folks said, oh, you can't just let people do that. Um, You know, what if somebody else wants to print whatever? And Sam stood up for it and said, no, we this is this is a time and and we're going to leave that there. And then, you know, he gets his house painted on the downside. We the the police. um, I think I I told you, I'll try to keep it brief, John. I told you this story. One of the things the the uh, two things happened after the initial um, demonstrations, which, as I said, the, the police went all military and it shocked people. Um, one of them was that they uh, accosted a, a young man, demonstrator, black man, who uh, asked him to move. And he said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to move. I have a right to be here. And and uh, they asked him again to move. And he and clearly he was waiting to be arrested. But instead, they shot him with a rubber bullet in the crotch, which um, put him in the hospital and he may never be able to have children. Uh, But the interesting thing was, this is a guy who had been a sensitivity trainer in the police academy. Um, 
So you, you have you have all of these things happening. And then there was a racist Facebook site that some cops were on. Uh, and all of a sudden, I don't I sort of don't know my city, but it's not turning into Portland. I mean, it, it's we have Black Lives Matter demonstrations down here. We have one in Willow Glen, my neighborhood, which is has a little main street and it's actually one of the whitest places in the city. And we have these Black Lives Matter demonstrations on the street corners almost every day. Um, I'm blabbering here, but it's, I've, <laughs> I haven't been able to talk. I'm, I have no forum anymore. So I haven't been able to talk politics for a while. And John, you just tapped into it. it it's what the hour is for. <laughs> Melissa. <laughs> it's all about, uh, yes. <laughs> do you guys remember the name Mario Woods? Does that ring a bell? Yes. yes. Yeah. That was, yeah. So back in 20, I think it was the end of 2015, or early 2016, he was shot by San Francisco police. Okay. Um, and around, or, and sometime early, I think 2016, then Mayor Ed Lee asked the Justice Department to come in and investigate and make a series of recommendations. And they made a ton. It was more than 100. And some were small, some were large. But since then, the city of San Francisco's PD has been implementing those recommendations and reporting the results first to the Justice Department, I think now to the state. But there's been um, a real effort to make some structural changes and, and be accountable for that. And I think I'm not saying it's perfect and I'm not saying something couldn't spark, you know, a real problem, but I think there's just less, there has been at least for, for a little while here, I think maybe at least since since Chief Scott came into um, his role, uh, uh, the city's just been a little ahead of the curve on that. And so you didn't have this longstanding problem with police. I mean, Portland, there's a history there um, between you know, between sort of the far right and and, and other folks. So um, I, I, that's one thing, you know, I'm loath to compliment San Francisco, but, <laughs> um, but, but it, it's something that they seem to uh, be doing right somewhat. Um, well, let's get into the whole controversy over, you know, the slogan defund the police. And what does it mean? And, and um, you know, we have seen San Francisco Mayor London Breed and some other city leaders across the country. They've not defunded the police. They have redirected some monies toward, you know, social services. The argument being that that money can help remove some of the causes of crime. Um, what do you think? I'll start with you, Chuck. I mean, when you hear defunding the police, do you think? It, it's, it, to me, it's one of those things where when someone says it and someone hears it, unless they get into a really big conversation, you have no idea if the person who hears it is hearing what the person who says it is saying. You know, what do they mean by it? Because the um, person who says it is saying the wrong word. <laughs> right? Defund means defund. If you hear yeah. the word defund, you are not the problem. Right. <laughs> like, the person <laughs> saying it is the problem. Right. They right. need a new slogan. It needs to be reduce or... Recycle. I don't know, whatever they want to say, but I'm so baffled <laughs> at the fact that your slogan needs a paragraph explaining it. You need a new slogan. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, old, the old line in politics, if you're explaining, you've lost. That's a, that's um, a good rant, though. Uh, permission to act like a clueless elderly white guy. That seems like a terrible slogan. And people said that the minute... They said they're going to use that. And those Republican ads say that all the time and that Trump says over and over, Biden wants to defund the police. There is a legitimate argument to be made. The thing that has changed policing and and the impression of police in the United States is video. We're seeing video and people can tell you, you, you cannot believe how police officers treat people of color. But to see someone get shot seven times in the back, to see someone put their knee on the person's neck until they die, that's a whole different deal. So we're on board. But then we go up to Portland. And again, as in my role as clueless elderly white person, what do they want up there? This is 100 days of, of and surely. Surely every one of them has been told, you realize you're only adding fodder to Trump's argument. You're making his argument for him. Is there something concrete? Is there something you want that that would that would that would mollify you and show that there'd been some progress? And I haven't seen it. They want to they want to fire the mayor. The mayor 
too much like Sam Leferno, who's been one of their great boosters. He's he yeah. is he's been Black Lives Matter. He's he's trying to get the troops out of Portland. I think this is where they lose the message, and they 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 lost it with defund the police, and they're losing it in Portland because you're making the case for Donald Trump. Yep, it, it is interesting how um, you have the that hardcore on on the left, the, the folks who, when there's violence at a demonstration, even before they, you know, learn that oh, actually it's caused by right wing, you know, agitators, they're willing to take it take credit blame for it, whatever, because, you know, it's time for the revolution sort of stuff. You have those folks, but it, the amazing thing to me watching the, in the wake of uh, the George Floyd thing was, I mean, I, I think we really saw a social sea change, you know, when, when you had Mississippi, um, you know, take the rebel flag out of its, its state flag. And um, I saw someone kind of making the, the, the uh, argument that that was what really happened was, you know, the NCAA saying, well, we're not going to do, you know, uh, games there or something like that. And I think, no, this is Mississippi. I think it was when the, the Southern Baptist Convention in Mississippi said, take that off the flag. It should not be there. You know, I mean, Mitt Romney and, and other Republicans, evangelicals marching for Black Lives Matter. Um, I mean, you, you, it's kind of a, a thing where like, you, you, you've won the argument as to we need to focus on this and we need to really do something, not just words. Um, but you do perhaps run the risk now of having the people who really just want to break some glass um, muddy the message. Yeah, I think that's John Zipper's speech for the day. Very good, John. I think that's always the problem, though, is we get everybody energized and there's always a question of what's next. Yeah. What, what is it that we would like to do that would make this a better situation? OK, we, we've got your attention. Now what are we going to do? And it's not just this situation. It's many situations, but it's always hard to come up with that. And I think that's where we're, you know, we had a lot of people, a lot of very mobilized people for Black Lives Matter marching in the streets peacefully. And it's it's the polls show it's kind of fallen off, and I think it's there's not a there's not a second act for it. What is the second act? And it can't just be anger and breaking glass. Well, and I think the um and, and the problem is that certain people who have said you know have articulated a second act is terrifying, um and totalitarian and and I'm not saying they're representative, but the the, the few who have actually. Talked about the next step. It's whoa, um, and it reminds me of Occupy a little bit in that it was you know it's a movement, it's a big deal, it's important, um, but the failure to have a real clear agenda about what you actually wanted to happen um, was a problem. I don't think anyone saw the George Floyd video and thought that's okay. Everyone, if you would have put anything on the ballot that said you know police reform, it would have passed, uh, and it still probably would pass. Um, but you got to, you know, what is it? What kind, you know, is it the unions that are the problem? Is it qualified immunity? Like, let's let's have a list, a real list, not a list that's a laundry list of everything that I've thought about since I was a freshman in college. Right. It needs to be like a real legitimate, um, achievable list of goals that that involve police reform. And I think people would be overwhelmingly in favor of, of something like that. But it, but if, if all you're doing is protesting and then sort of putting out, you know, 200, you know, page statements of how reality should be, then, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to see it going anywhere. Um, well, let's move on in the interest of time to a, a local story that became a national story. Uh, San Francisco's own speak, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, had her moment in the Twitter sphere recently over reports that she visited a hair salon in violation of business closure rules due to the pandemic. Many Republicans gleefully shared the news and claimed it showed the most powerful Democrat in the country was a hypocrite. Pelosi's camp shot back, claiming it was a setup. Now, Chuck, Nancy Pelosi is one of the smartest politicians in the country. Is this a serious gaffe or is it much hairdo about nothing? Well, first oh. of all, her, her hair looks great. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, I was amazed how I didn't think she handled this well at all. I, I, the idea that she was set up, she pushed back, she became defensive. Who yeah. didn't know that you weren't supposed to go to a hair salon? As I said, look, look at my hair. I, I know I'm not supposed to get my hair cut. I'm sure you're a public figure. I'm sure there was more... It was it was honored more in the breach than the observance, but even so, I 
I don't see how you do that. And if you're Nancy Pelosi, you have to know people are trying to video you. You may be going to be set up. But I, I think you would have been much better off to say that was an error in judgment. I shouldn't have done it. Um, you know, I'm taking this seriously and uh, and let's move on instead of trying to justify it somehow. It's a, it was a rare I thought it was a rare misstep for somebody who's as savvy as we're going to see. And it's possible that it was a setup. I mean, there's some indication that it was, but as I mean, she's a grown up. She should have known that. Yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah, I think so. I think the other thing that it brings into, you know, out very starkly is the fact that uh, hair salons and stylists um, who service people in San Francisco and in certain other areas that, that still are where it's still banned um, are really being treated like second class citizens. I can walk into a Whole Foods with a mask on and shop and it's fine. I'm supposed to stay about six feet away, but you know, you, you know, you, you, the aisles aren't that big. Uh, you know, there's construction going on above me all day, every day, Jack men with jackhammers, five or six of them in an apartment, the size of mine, um, trying to stay six feet apart, I'm sure. But you see these other industries that are allowed to function with certain very basic requirements. And yet, stylists and hairdressers and, and these other personal service, you know, um, providers are not. And there's really, and I'm not a doctor, but I fail to see um, the, the the real distinction there. And I'll point out, you know, Mayor London Breed's hair always looks fantastic. <laughs> and I resent that <laughs> because my hair is curly right now because without, <laughs> without the curl, it is a nightmare, disaster, sea witch looking oh, yeah. thing going on. It's horrible. But, you know, and, you know, there are worse problems in the world. But I am saying that one of the problem, one of the things that's the problem is that we can't, even with very basic, normal, legitimate um, protections, go into hair salons. Right now, you can only get a haircut if it's outside in the fire soup that is the air of the Bay area. So you can go out in that and get your hair cut or you can, or you can wait. Um, and, and it seems to me pretty unreasonable that we're, we even have these rules still. Yeah. And I think we, we knew this, but I think we're learning again that small businesses have a pretty small margin for error, that there's yeah. only a limited amount of savings probably. And then you may go through that and you may get a stimulus package from the government and that may tide you over. But the, the stories that we're hearing that the real evictions may not start until next month when people really do run out of what whatever savings, whatever surplus they had. And it's hair salons. It's definitely restaurants. It's there's a lot of small businesses that were living on a pretty small margin and are now really in need of help. The trade off is health. So it's, it's the question is what you do. One of our viewers medical. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Barbara. The, the medical justification for it, uh, right or wrong, but this is what it was, uh, was part of part of the thing with COVID, uh, with catching it, is not just being around people who have it, but being around them for more than five minutes and maybe talking and laughing and not just standing there. Um, and the sense was that an awful lot of hairdressers, and it's true, mine was like this, she shared a fairly small space. Um, uh, you just couldn't have a safe, there was no way to do distancing and masks wouldn't do that much good anyway, but there should have been, not everybody is like that. And there should have been a way to make some rules. I mean, I've also gone to stylists places that have barn like ceilings and you know it, it's not going to be as much of a problem um it's really a shame the small businesses around here that i know are never going to come back yeah some one of our viewers says breaking hair salons are permitted to open next week i haven't seen that but maybe that that's some news that just came out my, my um, understanding I, uh, that's wonderful i hope it's true my understanding is that it's um that the it's the end of september Although if, if next week, wonderful. And I and if the incident with Nancy Pelosi helped push that along, fine. <laughs> um, I do see the news that uh, the salon that this occurred at is going to be closing and will not be reopening. So, um, well, let's get into some other- Because yeah, the owner news. has $300,000 now because they still go to me. I would retire too and be like, oh, this is all way too much stress. <laughs> Yes. 
Well, let's let's get a bit now into some more of the campaign stuff before we end today. Uh, shortly after our last week to week, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, of course, announced his vice presidential running mate, California's junior senator Kamala Harris. Um, Harris kind of seems tailor made to add energy to his campaign. She's smart. She's polished. She's biracial. She's female. Tucker Carlson can't pronounce her, na- pronounce her name. Um, so let's talk a bit about what Harris has brought to this this uh, campaign. And and I guess I kind of want to find out ask from you, I'll start with you, Barbara, what do we here in the Bay Area know about Kamala Harris that the rest of the country doesn't know, for better or worse? Well, I have, I feel torn about this because I think she probably was a good choice for Biden, and I think she'll be a good campaigner and presses all the right buttons. I have never, uh, as editorial page editor until two years ago, I have never been impressed by Kamala. Um, she, um, um, there are things she takes credit for that other people will say she sold out, like on the housing deal she made with with lenders. There's a Congress member here who was furious with her when she was attorney general for accepting that deal, and she would not take calls from that person. Um, she never, I remember when she was running for senator and our, the main thing we wanted to talk to her about was water because Barbara Boxer had been the anti-Diane Feinstein. DiFi was, is, has always been happy to give the farmers all they want. Barbara would stand up for the urban areas, which we are. And, uh, and she didn't know anything about it. She just was not aware that that was... A thing. It, I mean, that's the impression she gave that she, well, she, you know, she'd look at it, she'd figure it out. You know, that said, she has a ton of energy. She's, um, you know, some people do grow in a job. I'm not going to say she can't do it. And there have been other people I've been wrong about, you know, coming out of a couple of interviews here and there. But, um, I have always been, because of her potential, I've always been disappointed in what I saw her actually do. Now, others? (laughs) Well, um, her 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 campaign for president did not go well. And it it started out as a house of fire. It was this huge rally in Oakland. Uh, She was everyone's favorite choice. And she just basically began to slip and went down, 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 down. And there was talk of dysfunction in her campaign. There were problems with uh, infighting, backstabbing, that kind of thing. And she eventually simply announced that she didn't have the money to continue. Having said that, now that she's Joe Biden's vice presidential candidate, I think she's killing it. And one of the things, it's, I mean this as kind of a joke, but the idea that she was wearing those Chuck Taylor basketball shoes, and that was trending, that's cute. But it also reinforces that she's young, that she's fresh, that she's with it. I mean, I don't see Mike Pence's floor shines, uh, you know, trending anywhere on the, on the, so I think it, I think it gives Joe Biden a lot of what he wants. She is personable, she is energetic, she is, she does seem young, and she stays, stays on message. Now, the, the, the word on her is if she's prepared, and it's not like she was when she was talking about the water, if she's prepared, she's very good. Mm-hmm. If she goes off the cuff, there's a, there can be a problem. But I think up until now, she's been strong. And I think that's uh, a reason Trump is, is attacking her specifically. I think he sees that as a real advantage. So I think she's performed better than I expected. I would say that. What about you, Melissa? Well, you know, the, the role of any VP is to do no harm. That's sort of your first job is don't cause problems for for the candidate. And in that role, she's been great. She hasn't embarrassed Joe Biden at all. She's been a good ambassador. She's towed the party line. Um, she's the person, you know, they can put in front of any group and she will you know, deliver. And so in that regard, um, like Barbara and Chuck, I believe that, you know, she is doing a great job for um, for Joe Biden. She always struck me as someone who leads from behind a bit in the sense that once there's a consensus, at least on the left, about how to deal with a certain problem, she sort of comes very forcefully out with that opinion. But she, um, and, and can be a really great advocate 
once this consensus is formed, but she's, um, in terms of being a leader, in terms of being someone who jumps right out right at the beginning and says, you know, yes or no. Um, it, it didn't strike me that as a, as a G for example, that was something that she spent a lot of time doing. It was, it was frequently things like, Oh, I'm going to go after the banks who, you know, tank the economy and screwed up our mortgages. It's like, well, yeah. Does anyone disagree? <laughs> you know, you can, you know, you can be very pro puppy and that's good because everybody loves puppies, but not everything's a puppy. You know what I mean? Like sometimes there are controversial issues and there are, um, there are times when you sort of have to show your values and where they, and go where they guide you. And it seems that, um, she, at least at times as AG, I think she disappointed some folks as, you know, for not being as much of a leader on certain issues as, mm -hmm. as they would have liked her to just, be. Just real quick. First of all, the AGs piss people off a lot. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a tough job to do that. You are going to make everybody happy, but I think she almost has the opposite problem, the opposite situation of Joe Biden in the debates, because everyone is saying she's going to take Mike Pence apart. She is, this is going to be the worst day of Mike Pence's life. Well, it better be now that we've, now that we've said all this and, you know, she's a prosecutor, she's, she's sharp on her feet. She's, she better, she better do a great debate. And if there is a faux pas, it, it could be a big deal just because of that. We've, we've built her expectations up really high. Oh, that's, that's a good point. I think people are really looking forward. To, I, I'm looking forward to seeing it. And, and there's no question. I would want to be clear that um, she has taken certain stands that are important and that a lot of people appreciate. And she is, you know, unquestionably somebody who is uh, great at debating and questioning, um, you know, certain, you know, opponents. And so very talented, obviously, in that regard. And so she'll shine at the debate, I think. Um, although, like Chuck, I think the bar's been set pretty high. Just quickly, I, I, I have an acquaintance who has worked both in the Bloomberg administration in New York and has worked with Kamala in Sacramento. And this is a few years ago. Uh, someone asked her, what, how do you compare Mike Bloomberg and, and Kamala? What's, what's it like working with him? And her bottom line was Bloomberg is a leader. Kamala is a climber. And that sort of stuck with me as as I actually later got to got to know her a little bit. It, it worried me. But but if she can if she can handle the debates well and and uh, get, you know, help get Biden elected, I think that's terrific. And and who knows, maybe she will grow into leadership as things go on. Well, I'm sure some folks would say would defend her on the basis of, yeah, she's ambitious. An well, ambitious anyone who runs for president is ambitious. Too. Yeah. Well, um, now someone, uh, one of our audience people asked, and I didn't have this as one of our topics, but it's one I guess we kind of have to talk about since we're headed this way and in some places people are starting to vote very soon. Um, what are your thoughts on whether or not the president accepts the election results does it matter if he accepts the re election results will he create a kerfuffle um will he john, appeal to john, the militias melissa i want to take this opportunity i've been waiting for months to apologize to chuck nebius what because, yes because you don't even remember this probably but in our last irl week to week this came up and I was like, and you were like, this is a big deal. And I was like, Chuck, don't be crazy. The military will drag him from the White House. No big deal. He has to go. Uh, and I'm so sorry. I should not have dismissed you because actually I've since come to understand that that's only half true. <laughs> that there is a possibility. It was interesting. There's a there's a, a man and I, I'm so sorry I'm forgetting his name, but he's he's written a, a book about elections and the potential here for these um, during this mail ballot election. And in his scenario, and this is interesting because in California, we get this because we've been doing this for so long. But y'all know when you watch the election results on election night, it's more conservative on election night. Right. You're getting the small places, you're getting the older people voting early, and it tends to swing to the left election day when those later votes come in. And so what he says is that um, there's a possibility that, especially for places where they're not used to this, where on election night, it looks like the president has won, 
But then once the votes are counted subsequently, it looks like uh, he has lost. And so now you have two people claiming, you know, that, 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 that they've been elected president. And then it just sort of goes, uh, you know, potential for going off the rails from there is real. And so uh, and so that is something I had not thought of when I um, told Chuck to chill it out. But, <laughs> but now I'm definitely freaked out. <laughs> Would it, be, would it be possible for you to write that apology out and send it over to me? I, I will record it for your it's voice. on video, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, it, it doesn't matter what someone says in a concession speech or a victory speech. That yeah. doesn't have any legal power, right? It's it's In this case, it's really only what the Electoral College will vote on. Is it? Do I have my constitution right there? Because I might not. I, um, I, you know, you do, but I think there are legal issues that can be raised, and I don't know. I mean, you, you recall Al, a lot of people thought Al Gore should keep fighting for his victory, and uh, he made the decision that for the good of the country and the person he was running against was not evil incarnate, you know, he conceded. Um not going to happen this time if there's any question at all. So. Yeah, I think the I think the level of confusion that they're attempting to sow over over a vote by mail. I don't know if you saw, but the other day someone tweeted um, supposedly an anecdote. He said, "My parents just got a ballot for me at their home, and I haven't lived uh, in California, and I haven't lived at home in ten years." I haven't mailed yet. Yeah. And and someone retweeted it and said, by the way, California doesn't send their ballots out for another month. So this is this is but that is exactly the kind of thing where what Melissa is saying is Trump looks good on election night because of in person voting. Right. And then he says, I I won. And then he said, well, wait a minute, the mail-in ballots are coming. And he says, no, those are all invalid because there's no way to protect them and dogs are voting and people are voting two or three times. <laughs> and you know, it's so, again, it's the kind of thing I never thought I'd see in the United States of America, but now I'm kind of worried about it. Yeah. Well, wouldn't a flip side of all of this or any worry over this be that regardless of how he loses, he's going to claim it was a it was a it was rigged. It was there was cheating. I mean, he's already been claiming, of course, that he's already if he if I lose, it's only because, you know, foreign countries printed mail-in ballots and, and sent them in by the millions and uh you know democrats are voting 37 times and such so um i mean we're we're going to get that reaction no matter what i mean unless he wins yeah and I, the other thing i would say in maybe some encouragement is he says a lot of stuff you know he says a lot of things that are going to happen and, and they never do you know he, he was going to remember the sculpture garden he was going to make with all of all the confederate monuments we're going to have that ready to go he wasn't going to fund any of this he's not going to fund any of the schools that are teaching the the new york times uh piece that's not going to happen he wasn't going to give money to cities that had democratic leadership because they weren't being nice to him i mean he throws all this stuff out there and i if there's one thing we've seen is that a lot of it is not thought very well through. So I don't know that he can mount a real effort. But chaos is his brand. And that's what I think he's hoping to do with the election. Well, I mean, there's a couple of things that are sort of hopeful in all of this. One is that Democrats, I think, have, have recognized this issue and are trying very hard to educate people in places where this is kind of new and tell them to vote as soon as they can so that we don't end up hopeful so that we can get, you know, some folks on the left voting so it doesn't it result in a huge swing right and so they, they they sort of can get in there and then make it not look like things have moved uh and also to let people know that um you know that you're probably not going to know who won on election night they need to adjust those expectations you're not going to sit there i mean everybody loves you know john king with the map and the precincts and you know that's a, that's super fun we're probably not going to be able to do that this year and letting people know that um you know you need to vote because it, the only way to really do this in a way that's legitimate or that appears legitimate is for it to be a bit of a landslide yeah. and so the hope is that it's not close and i think democrats are trying to make sure it's not close so that they can um not have to deal with a protracted thing because Barbara's totally right. I mean, Al Gore stood up and said, nope, we're going to stop this. Richard Nixon, 1960, said, you know what? You know, there was a whole, that whole Chicago, <laughs> the Chicago issue and, with Kennedy. And Richard Nixon said, you know what? No, let's put a stop to this. We're just going to, I'm going to step back because this is creating too much chaos. And so we can, when you can't count on that, 
you know, that's a problem. The last thing I would say that is that is potentially helpful is that in, if you look at the swing states, a number of them have Republican secretaries of state. Mm-hmm. So hopefully if they're certifying election results, if they've got their observers out in the field and they're confident that they're, you know, doing all they can to keep the election safe, that um, that folks on the right will uh, be more inclined to accept those election results uh, than they would if it was a Democrat secretary of state. And I, the only other, thing I, only other thing I'd say is that we should start thinking then about how we're counting these votes. And is it possible to find a way to count some of the mail-in ballots as they come in so we don't have to start from zero on election day? I mean, the, the, the question, of course, would be security because you can't have that getting out that that Biden is ahead 55 to 40 three that's not but but if you could do that and count those count those ballots have a jump start on it it would it would speed up the process and i think it would add legitimacy so maybe we have to think about that as well well that's going to have to be our last comment for the night as we wind down our program today i just want to pat ourselves on the back for getting through the entire hour without once mentioning jerry falwell jr and pool boys (laughs) thank you (laughs) Thank you to our great panel today, Melissa Kane, Barbara Marshman, and CW Nevius, and thanks to all of you watching and listening online. Stay safe and healthy. Have a good weekend. We'll see you in the, wherever this all ends up. Good night.